let's see if we can get this thing rolling. It takes just a little while. I got to send it over there. And then I have to refresh my personal page. And uh, then following that, I have to share it publicly. For some reason, it does not want to go public naturally. Well, it's saying live already. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's live on that side, and we're live. Uh, but now we are not only live, but uh, we are online and we are ready to go. I think all things are lined up. So uh, welcome to uh, Reflections Upon the Precious Book Divine. My name is Rick Pope Joy, and uh, I have the distinct pleasure of serving as your host. But I have a double distinct pleasure, uh, not only just to serve as your host, but uh, uh, Brother Mike Bonner is with us today. And uh, we are certainly glad that uh, he could join us, and uh, uh, we're uh, good to have you, Brother Bonner. Glad to be here, brother. Real All glad right. to be here. I'm gonna turn I'm gonna turn you down just for a half a second, so I can uh, pull this up and uh, expand it. We should be uh, we should be uh, moving up. Here we go. Make sure that I get all things now. Oh, mute that. There we go. Now it looks like uh, now I can get to my comments. Uh, so often I can't get to my comments and. Uh, uh, I figured out how to do that. It takes an old dog. You know, you can teach, Brother Bonnie, you can teach an old dog new tricks, but it takes a long time for him to learn it. <laughs> I'll leave that alone, brother. <laughs> All right. I know that we have several of our uh, fellow Bible students that will be joining us here in uh, just a minute. Well, Brother Bonnie, I want to kind of set this up. I know that you haven't been with us all week long, but uh, uh, we have been talking about uh, uh, the, the concept of the transformed mind uh, based upon Romans chapter 12. And in particular, over the last couple of days, we have uh, come down toward the end of uh, Romans chapter 12, verses uh, 14 through 16, verses 17 uh, through 21. And when you get there, you you you, you begin to deal with some uh, uh, some concepts of uh, uh, how to do uh, what to do when people do you wrong, and uh, so there are naturally some questions that are that arise out of these texts and uh, things in regards to uh, vengeance, self defense. Uh, things such as that, but also the concept of uh, honor killings. And uh, of course, honor killings bring up uh, uh, the, the concept of, uh, of the avenger of blood and uh, things such as that. So uh, we have uh, several of the questions that we have are generated because of our discussion on living this transformative life. And uh, what does that really mean? And uh, so uh, uh, with, with that in mind, uh, uh, we're going to kind of open this up. But is there a difference between, and I'm going to get to, we got several of our Bible students uh, uh, that are lining up here, and I want to give them time uh, to get here. Um, once they find uh, the feed up on Facebook, then uh, they begin to join us. And I see that Brother David Johnson, uh, is uh, here with us from uh, uh, Marlin and uh, uh, Sister Ferris from Alabama. I see that Sister Woodall way up yonder in uh, the north woods of Wisconsin and uh, Sister Higgins from uh, South Texas uh, has joined us. And I, it looks like we have many more that haven't uh, uh, chimed in yet, but that's all right if you... Uh, if you are listening to us and uh, you would like, we always love to know where our fellow Bible students, Brother Furness is here from uh, Purcell, Oklahoma, my old stomping grounds uh, in that area anyway. And uh, uh, by the way, Brother Furness, uh, happy anniversary. I understand that today's your anniversary. So we're glad that uh, you could join us uh, uh, 
uh, on your anniversary. And uh, so let's see here, um, uh, Brother Mike, um, uh, when we start talking about the concept of, uh, of uh, uh, self-defense and vengeance, I want to kind of start there because we really do need to define our terms to figure out uh, uh, what exactly that we're talking about. Uh, so that we we understand, uh, is there a difference between the two concepts of uh, self-defense and vengeance? A lot of times when you get in a discussion of uh, whether or not a Christian can defend himself, generally it's with relationship to gun control or something such as that. And the accusation is generally made well, uh, if you're a Christian, then you're a hypocrite because the Bible says that you're not supposed to take vengeance. And so any kind of self-defense is gen generally lumped into a discussion of vengeance at that particular point. And uh, uh, so I want us to uh, begin with that particular concept of, uh, of the relationship between the two. And uh, uh, I'm just going to open it up. Romans chapter 12, verse number 19, of course, clearly says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And uh, so uh, uh, I wanted to uh, begin with that and, uh, and, and then ask... Uh, uh, ask this question. I'm going to open it up to you at this particular point. Is there a difference? What what exactly are we talking about when we use these terms? Brother Pope, that's a good question. I guess it depends on who you talk to. Um, and I, I mean, I really hate to even say it that way because we live in such a postmodern world today where people are defined in their own terms. And so... I might approach this from an angle of not being as passionate as others because I personally uh, don't get a, a lot of joy in talking or even thinking about this type of subject. And the reason why is because before Christ, uh, I didn't mind putting them bullets in you. I didn't mind shooting at you if you mess with me. I didn't, and I say that not you know, with a smile on my face, you know, I didn't, you mess with me. I was trying to take you out and I was trying to make sure that you would land down without, without breath in you. And so, um, that's not something that I take lightly. And so when I came to come to the scriptures and I see that, uh, there's a balance in here that God desires for us to strike. And we see it not just in the new Testament, but also in the old Testament. And so I don't want to go too far in my thoughts, but I do want to say that I see the balance in uh, if we can approach it from Luke chapter three and verse number 14 with, with John the Baptist and how he is talking to those soldiers. And you remember, and looking at that particular principle, he says, uh, do no violence. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea there is don't intimidate, don't shake people down. Now, the reason why I start here is because when you get to like a Romans 13 and verse number four, as it relates to authority figures and how they have the responsibility of being God's ministers, law enforcement, and the Bible says that they don't bear the sword in vain. Now, if, the, if they don't bear the sword in vain, that means that it can be born in vain if they are doing violence to people if they are shooting people without a justified reason. And so if one is true, the opposite has to be true as well, Brother Pope Joy. Right. And so um, I remember about a, less than a year ago now, uh, I took a concealed handgun carry class and 60% um, of that class was if you shoot somebody, you better, number one, be sure. Number two, you better make sure that you have legal representation before that happens. And mm -hmm. number three, you might not get out of the deal even though you have a concealed handgun carry license. And so that 
placed a lot of emphasis on my mind as a Christian just because I have the ability doesn't mean that I'm going to get out of this scot-free if I have to. Now, I will say from my studies, and I'll let you talk after this because I have a lot more to, to say, from my studies, there is justification from Scripture for us to protect our homes, to protect our own person. So I want us to be thinking you know, it's interesting when you think about uh, the, the passage that you brought up in Luke chapter 3, uh, that, and that brings in really another question in regards to this, and, and that is, how can a Christian then serve in the military or as a police officer where uh, one of the responsibilities that they will have uh is to take life and uh, so some have argued that uh, a christian cannot serve in that capacity but yet you'll notice that uh, uh the text does not say uh that they need to give up that job it just says that they ought to receive their wages with contentment what wages the wages they're receiving for being in the military or being a police officer in right. other words don't don't run an extortion ring, which right. is what some soldiers and police officers uh, in ancient times, probably even modern times, have and continue to do. So with that in mind, he says, as he does with all of us, whatever you do, uh, do righteously, right? I, I love the, uh, I, I, I tell people all the time, I think every time I've gone to this verse, I've uh, used this particular statement, but uh, there there is a sermon that every politician needs to hear. And uh, it is the sermon that Paul preached to uh, Felix when he said that it re he reasoned to him of righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come. Every man in authority needs to have a lesson on how to exercise authority with righteousness. <laughs> right? I, I need to know how to be right with God and my fellow man. I need to exercise temperance so I'm not engaged in under the table uh, activity or extortion. Uh, and if I keep the judgment in mind, uh, then uh, I will understand how all of this affects m my eternal life. And so, what, you know, you bring up Luke chapter 3, and I think that's an excellent place for us to start in regards to that, because all of life. Now, listen, there are some things a Christian cannot be. I, I could never serve and be righteous by being a drug dealer, uh, a, uh, uh, a person who sells prostitutes, or, or uh, you know, I, 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 you cannot serve in those capacities. I, I could not uh, own a gambling uh, institution. I mean, we could go on and on with things that I cannot do. I could not own a liquor store, things such as that. Uh, those would be things that would be foreign to my Christian existence. But John tells these individuals that this is an exercise that can be done correctly, and uh, uh, all of life is to be done that way. What I thought was interesting, Mike, and, and you went from there, you must have been reading my mind, you went from there to Romans chapter 13, because I think it's important when we consider where he says, dearly beloved, in chapter 12, 12 and verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. Uh, and how does God exercise that vengeance? You say, chapter 13 and verse number 4 is one of those ways in which vengeance is exercised. For he, now who is the he in the context? That's government, right? Established by God for the purpose of uh, ministering uh, to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth the sword, he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God. Now notice, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Can I stop the, real quick for the Pope George? Yes, sir, go ahead. 
the very fact that the governmental officials, magistrates, uh, you think about the one that is bearing the sword, you can put law enforcement there, okay? These are God's ministers. And the reason why, as you read, uh, for good, for good, okay? And so the idea of kalas, good, is the same idea for the Christian, Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we were created in Christ Jesus unto kalas, good works. And so this is why we, as the people of God, we pray for those, we pay our taxes. Why? Because these are God's ministers, God's ministers. And so when you have people who want to defund, when you have people who want to go against that which is legal and right, they're not just cutting their own throats. They're cutting the throats of those who uh, they love too. And so the last thing we want is evil running rampant. That's the last thing you want. And so the wild, wild west was okay to a certain degree because you had a level of morality there. But when people uh, don't have that level of morality, it goes back to the days of the judges that because there was no king, every man did what was right in their own eyes. Sorry to cut you off, but I just wanted to bring that point out. Excellent point there. Uh, Brother David mentions in the chat window in Matthew 8, Jesus found a right, found righteousness in a Roman centurion. And uh, so again, all of these things play a part of that. I, I wanna turn your attention now to 1 Peter chapter two, uh, because Peter uh, is saying the same thing as the apostle Paul in 2 Peter chapter two. I'm gonna begin in verse number 13, where it says that you submit yourself to every ordinance of man to, for the Lord's sake, uh, it, uh, whether it be the king as supreme. By the way, exact same terminology. Uh, we submit for uh, for uh, conscience sake, right? We submit every ordinance of man, whether it be to the king as supreme, uh, and uh, or to governors or to them that are sent by him. Why are they sent? For the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of them that do well. And uh, so the punishment of evil doers. Uh, so there, now again, what I want us to look at uh, even more particular here is the relationship between this idea of self-defense and this idea of vengeance. And so what I would like for us to do is go back to Exodus uh, chapter 22 for just a second. Exodus chapter 22. Now. I realize that as soon as I go there, I know in my mind one of the arguments that's going to be made. Uh, and so I'm going to set that aside just for a second. And I want you to notice in Exodus chapter 22, uh, is there a difference? And this is really why I want to start. Is there a difference between self-defense and vengeance? I think in this verse, uh, you clearly have a difference being established by God. So he says in verse number two, this is Exodus 22, two, if a thief be found breaking up uh, and be smitten that he die, that there be no blood shed for him. In other words, if a thief is breaking into your house, he's stealing uh, items, uh, it says, uh, that there is no blood, the blood avenger does not come into play at this particular point. But now notice verse number three. And this, I think, is uh, uh, shows us the distinction between uh, self-defense, someone breaking into your home. Obviously, the context is at night. How do I know that? Because of verse number three. It says, if the sun be risen upon him. In other words, if he had broken in that night and then the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold as a thief. In other words, uh, if it is later, uh, you cannot uh, take his life at that time. That shows us a distinction between uh, that which is uh, killing in self-protection 
uh, either property or person. And in this case, what is being identified is property, not person. Now, your person will be under attack if somebody breaks into your house at night. I understand that, but he's talking about property here. Now, these two verses, I believe, clearly outline for us the distinction. One is in the case of a person that is killed while committing a crime. There is no fault upon the individual who killed him. But if you wait until it's all over and then you go after him, that would be vengeance. Because, see, at that point, there is no immediacy in regards to your person or property. And so you can deal with him according to the law under which you live, but you cannot seek personal vengeance in regards to that. Now, Brother Mike, oftentimes people will stop me right here and they'll say, well, now, Rick, we are New Testament Christians. We don't live under the law. And I would say, you know, you're absolutely right. So let's take Romans 12, verse number 19, completely out of our Bibles, right? You say, wait a minute, that's the New Testament. Yes, it is. I want to read it one more time. I almost left off the last part of the verse, but notice he says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself but rather give place under wrath for, wait a minute, for reason why I'm not vengeful, for it is written. Mm. Mike, I wonder where it is written. Is it written somewhere between Matthew and Revelation? No, it's written in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 32 and verse number 35. That's where it is written. Now, Paul goes all the way back to the law of Moses in order to establish a principle. This is where I think, Mike, a lot of people fail to appreciate how to use the Old Testament to establish principles. Jesus did it in Matthew chapter 19, uh, verses 1 through 9. He went all the way back to the book of Genesis in order to establish the principle that marriage is one man and one woman. But you say, some people say, well, yeah, but Jesus lived under the old law. He could do that, right? Well, how about the Apostle Paul in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, when he's talking about the relationship of leadership in the home and uh, in the church? He goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, uh, based upon two principles. First principle, man was created first. Second principle, it is the woman that sinned and not that is engaged in uh, because of deception uh, uh, sinned. And so what you have here is that there are principles found in the Old Testament that the New Testament writers understood. Vengeance and self-defense is one of those items, and Paul brings that out in Romans chapter 12. And so if we're talking about a distinction and, and uh, between vengeance and self-defense, I would suggest to you that Exodus 22 is an excellent example uh, uh, in regards to that. Well, we do know that um, in Numbers chapter 35, verses 9 through 11, as... Uh, God is preparing the children of Israel to go into the promised land, there was going to be six cities of refuge. Mm -hmm. And those six cities of refuge was going to be for accidental killings. The next part of that, verses 16 through 21, for our listeners and those who are viewing, we have examples of murder. And God outlines what a murderer is. When they have an enemy, they want to strike him with an iron. In verse number 16, they want to strike him with a wooden uh, weapon. In verse number 18, uh, they want to strike him by pushing him down through hatred. In verse number 20, uh, they want to push him suddenly uh, without uh, any type of hatred, throwing something at him, lying in wait. These are murderers, okay? And this is the idea of 
being vengeful. God has never wanted his people to be like this. He calls them, Brother Pope Joy, murderers, okay? Right. Now, when we think about uh, venge being vengeful, it reminds me of David. David, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse number 26 and verse number 33, you remember Nabal. His name means fool, and he was a fool against David. David protected his sheep, um, but he did not want to give him provisions. Now, here's the point I want to make with this. David got 400 of his uh, soldiers, chariots, and he was about to go do Nabal in. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that in 1 Samuel chapter 25, for our listeners, if you'll turn there in verse number 26, I want to make this point here because we're talking about vengeful or being uh, or avenging. First Samuel chapter 25, and verse 26. Here the Bible says, Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek him seek harm for my Lord as Nabal. Drop down to verse number 33. Notice what David says to Abigail. In verse number 33, here the Bible says, and blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. And I have a little note in my uh, in my notes here, and, and I said, hopefully someone will talk us out of avenging ourselves. Okay, why? Re Romans 12 and verse number 19. Don't avenge yourself. Rather give place unto wrath. All right? God will take care of that. Now, that's a big difference between someone breaking into your home and you jumping in the car with your, your friends looking for someone who has broken into your home. That's a big difference. Even in the world that we live in, Brother Pope Joy, they would call that premeditated. You will go to jail for that. One of the points that I failed to make earlier in that concealed handgun carry class, they say that you will pay, if, not, if you're not careful, shooting someone and it's not justified civilly, judicially, financially, and emotionally. Yes. And so that's a big difference. And so if you pull the trigger on someone, you better know what you're doing, and it better be justified. But still, um, you're gonna you're probably gonna pay for it in one way or the other. Let me go ahead and add to the point that you made with the Exodus 22. Was that right? Yes, sir. In uh, when it comes to self-defense, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 29, the only way you're really going to get all of what Jesus is saying out of the text, you got to do your word study. You got to be hermeneutically sound when you deal with these type of situations and circumstances. Jesus said in verse number 29, for how can one enter? The Greek word there is ace erkomai same word that we find in Matthew 5 and verse number 20, entering into the kingdom. Yep. All right. And so, uh, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the, of the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter, meaning go inside. Okay. And so he says uh, in verse number 29, or how can one enter a, Erica, my, a strong man uh, one cannot enter into the kingdom except they go in by the door, John 2 and verse number 10. You think of the strong man here, the strong man's what? His house, his right. dwelling. Now, the word literally means his edifice, his house, his family, his home, his habitation. We're not talking about someone who is just sitting outside and you got somebody driving up, blah, 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 and this and that. No, you are entering into someone's house. That's unlawful, Brother Pope Joy. Okay? And Jesus uses this point, except one enters into a strong man's house and binds him up. 
literally to fasten him with chains, to bind him and his wife up to steal their goods. Now, I want us to notice in Luke chapter 11 and verse number 21, same context, but Luke brings out uh, a little bit more in detail that will actually help us in our thinking. In Luke chapter 11 and verse number 21, there the Bible says this. And I love the terminology here. Verse 21. Uh, when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. When a strong man fully armed, you get that? Fully armed. Now look at Mark chapter 3 and verse number 27. Brother Pope, no, we can't make this up. These are Jesus' words. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 27, I was convicted on some of this my own self. Now, in the Matthew 12, 29 account, it says one thing as it relates to, or how can one enter a strong man's house? In Mark chapter 3 and verse number 27, there the Bible says no one can enter a strong man's house. And so the implication there is, Brother Pope Joy, is that if one is entering to a strong man's house, that means that he doesn't belong in there. Right. And then here he says, no one in Mark chapter 3 and verse number 27 enters a strong man's house and plunders his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will enter into his house or plunder his house. And so the idea here that we find here is that no one is going to allow you to just enter into their house, take their life, take their goods without some type of fight. That's not going to happen. And so here we have the idea of being fully armed in Luke chapter 11 and verse number 21. And that comes from the Greek word katapolizo, which literally means to furnish fully with arms, to be equipped fully with arms. And it reminds me of some of these fools in our government who say that we're going to come and disarm Texas. And then you got these people who got these bumper stickers, I wish you would. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, no, there's a reason why. And so when you think of, does Jesus, um, does Jesus teach that one can have arms in order to protect themselves? The answer is yes. Now, we have to also keep in mind that we are a spiritual people. We're in the business of saving souls. And so we want to make sure that if somebody's entering to our house, we better make sure we know what we're doing because you can still go to jail behind it. But we live in a time now where doing the right thing might end you up in jail and doing the wrong thing may have someone to be free. So we have to pick our poison, which one we're going to be. You know, and we, we have seen examples of that. Not all justice systems uh, execute justice on a consistent basis. Right. Now, I will say that out of all of the justice systems of the world, I prefer this one. I, I'm not just staying here because this is where I was born. Uh, this is not just the, the, the land of my nativity, you might say, but I believe that the justice system here is the best in the world, maybe the best the world has ever seen. Now, does that mean that there are not infractions to that and that we do not see that? I, I think we can see that uh, uh, all over the place. Uh, we do have to be careful at times uh, to make a decision upon a judgment or a justice system not knowing all the facts. Uh, we do need to have the facts, but at the same time, just because it is called a justice system does not necessarily mean that it always meets out justice. But let me let me uh, add another argument to this, Mike, and uh, uh, I realize that we've crossed the halfway point already in regards to this. Uh, so I do want to offer this discussion as well. Uh, Jesus said that all the law, that is the law of Moses, all of the law, not some of it, hang upon the principle of love God first and love thy neighbor 
2nd. That's Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. And there are other passages. Mark uh, also deals with this, I believe, in Mark chapter 12. But the, the concept is that the law hangs upon those two principles. Now, so here's my question then. Uh, Exodus 22, is that a part of the law? Yes. yes. Well, the answer is yes. Does it hang upon the principle of loving God and loving thy neighbor as thyself? Yes. The answer to that is yes, right? Jesus said all, not some, not bits and pieces, but all of the law uh, hangs upon those two principles. So if it is, uh, uh, if there is such a thing as what we would call justifiable homicide or the taking of life, homicide is just uh, the taking of life, uh, there is a difference then between killing and murder. One is justified, one is not. Is it not a principle, therefore, of love that I am responsible, as you mentioned in Luke chapter 11 and verse number 21, to be well armed to protect my family? I have responsibility as a husband and as a father, as a grandparent. In fact, I would dare say that the principles of hospitality itself demands that anyone that enters into my domain, that I am responsible to protect at that principle of love. So if, well, if yes, sir. Uh, Yes. Keepeth. To keep from being snatched away, preserved safe and unimpaired, to be on guard. We think of the principles from the Exodus 22 text, but we literally have Jesus saying that and so by the way brother mike the principle is a law here we have the lawgiver saying it I, I i want you to go back and restate that you broke up really bad on my end so I, i'm sure that it came through uh broken up as well on the facebook and that's an excellent point to make so if you could just go back to that luke 11 and 21 and restate that yeah, in the Luke 11, um, the verse 21, with the word guard, the New King James Version, the word keep in the King James Version, the word literally means to protect one from a person or thing, to protect lest he suffers violence, to keep from being snatched away, meaning kidnapped, preserved safe, and unimpaired, to be on guard. And so even though Exodus 22 principally is a great passage that we can draw principles and principle is law. We got Jesus literally saying this. And so we take the words of Jesus and we apply it to our lives and we use wisdom as we are striving to be the people that we need to be to protect our families, ourselves, and uh, even our homes. So I wanna, I wanna maybe, unless you have uh, something else, I wanna end, uh... Uh, back at Romans chapter 12 with regards to uh, uh, this first ideal of self-defense and uh, versus the vengeance, uh, go back to Romans chapter 12 and, and notice that while the activity is uh, going on, while we are in the fray of the assault, uh, the Bible is very clear that we have a responsibility, not just can we, uh, you know, every now and then, Mike, I'll see a, a little meme come across uh, Facebook and it'll say, uh, should parents be given the right to spank their children? And almost every time uh, I go and if I say anything, I'll say that's the wrong question. If we give that question a listening, then we've got, uh, it's not should parents, 
It's no one has the right to take that away. It is an inalienable right of parents uh, to be able to do that. It's not something that the government gives, that society gives. It is something that God gave and cannot be taken away. Now, again, we're not talking about abuses. We're talking about uh, the ability and whether or not it not only should, but must be exercised with regards to our children. And so sometimes uh, we have the same thing with regards, uh, should Americans, and it's not even an American issue, although we realize from a legal standpoint, the Second Amendment, things such as that, listen, it is an inalienable right of a man to protect his family. I don't care what the government says. That is his responsibility given to him by God and no government has the right to take that away. I don't care if we have a second amendment or not, you cannot take that responsibility away from uh, uh, from an individual. Now, I appreciate the second amendment. It gives me recourse in a court of law, but when it comes to the court of eternal law, I, uh, I give in to that uh, uh, above all others. And uh, so, but when the fray of the assault is on, a man has a responsibility to protect his family. Now, if I fail to stop the attack, and that does happen at times, uh, and let's say that uh, uh, a family uh, are uh, not just uh, uh, brutalized, but maybe even murdered at that particular time. Romans 12 verses uh, 19 through 21, then as well as Deuteronomy 35, uh, 32, tell me that I do not have a right to seek vengeance. I can seek justice, but I cannot seek vengeance. If I do, and I mentioned this the other day, Mike, who would, who would dare impose upon the responsibility of God? The Bible clearly says, that vengeance belongeth to me. Now, if I take vengeance, I leave no room for the wrath of God, and uh, I am imposing myself as God. And that is a serious matter indeed. And uh, I used an illustration. I, I don't know if I can find that illustration. I forgot the guy's name, but you remember the case a few years ago uh, where the uh, lady police officer uh, came in and uh, uh, to a person's house and uh, shot them because of uh, uh, she was she, she claimed she was in fear and she took an innocent man's life and she was on trial and uh, uh, I remember that young man on the stand saying uh, and listen she had uh, shed tears it, it appeared as if she was uh, uh, seeking uh, forgiveness. She asked for that. Uh, and I remember him stating, I don't know about others, but as for me, uh, and this was his brother that was killed, he said, I forgive you. And I remember that. I remember the judge being in tears. I remember the police officer, big old burly guy, uh, and, and you could see the, the tears in his eyes. But then he went even further. I don't know if you remember this, Brother Mike, but he said to the judge, he asked the judge, can I give her a hug? And I, I thought to myself, and then other people came out of the courtroom. They were furious and uh, that she didn't get a life sentence. And she, you know, there are a lot of things that could have been done, but, but their motto was no justice, no peace. His motto was... I'm leaving room for the vengeance of God. And I thought, wow, what a powerful illustration of uh, the, the Bible principle. He couldn't stop it at that moment when it was happening. Now, if yeah. he had been there and had a gun, it would have been within his right to shoot that person. Yeah. Yeah, that was the, uh, that was the case of uh, Amber Geiger and uh, Botham John. Yes. And uh, I remember that holistically, and um, that's a that's an interesting case, and that's something that when I saw it, I was touched as well. 
But you're always going to have different views of that based upon how they view life. Yes. So uh, that's why I've learned to give people space to be who they're going to be because they're going to be who they're going to be anyway. Um, I appreciate the point as it relates to the justice, the biblical principle. I'm sorry, the biblical illustration that I want to give is Luke 18 with the uh, the widow before the judge. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And remember yes. what he said. Yes. In verse number three yeah, get justice for me uh, from my adversary. And uh, you remember what he said. And he would not for a while, but afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I think about that, and this is this is just Mike Bonner. I personally, uh, I don't live, and I think I don't think people do, but I don't live to get back at people. I'm not trying to be a person. Again, I said before earlier on the broadcast. I know how it is to want to take a person's life. I don't feel that way now. Um, I've told you this before personally, Brother Pope Joy, that if I'm going to shoot somebody, I'm going to shoot them not to kill them. You said, no, nah, that ain't going to happen. Like, no, it will, because I've trained myself to think like that. And that's just me. Um, right. I know how it is to want to take somebody's life. I don't feel that way. I don't think that way no more. Yeah. Um, if somebody is messing with my wife and my family, then I'm going to do what I can to get them off of them. If they force me to have to take their life, then I'll deal with that. But that's not what I'm trying to get. You yeah. know, I'm just trying to do all that I can to help people get to the Lord. And um, But that's just my thoughts. And I don't see me sinning, thinking like that. Right. And so we live in a very uh, touchy world today where mm. not only are we willing to counsel you, we're willing to kill you. Yep. And um, Jesus, I remember when the disciples wanted to uh, rain down fire from heaven like Elijah. And Jesus <laughs> said, you know not what spirit you are of. Yep. And so I keep that in mind as well. Uh, so I'm right there in the middle as it relates to this particular subject. As it relates to vengeance, I'll leave that to God. He'll take care of that. As a matter of fact, I sent that out this morning. In Ecclesiastes 8 and verse number 12, you remember? In I do. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 12 and 13, I want to read this to our uh, listeners and viewers. Ecclesiastes 8, verse number 12 and 13. We got a couple minutes here. Oh, yeah. And the Bible Good. says, uh, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God. Hopefully that's us. We fear God. And those and uh, who fear before him, but it will not be well with the wicked. You got a man enter into another man's house that's wickedness. You got a man enter into another person's business that's wickedness. Right. All the protesting and all that mess, taking people's property, burning down their building that's wicked. You know, but as a business owner, I'm not going to try to run them all down and kill them all. I'm not right. going to do that. And so, notice what he goes on to say. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which as which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. And so we have a responsibility to protect our homes. We better. We have a responsibility to protect our wives and children. We better do that. And yeah. uh, but but this this attitude that I see even among some brothers, you know, well, I'm, I'll just go out there and take them out. That's the wrong attitude. Stop that. Stop. That. You know, if we're going to do anything, let's do what we can to be an influence of righteousness in, in a crooked and perverse generation as we shine as lights. Right. And 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 uh, uh, that's that's absolute. You know, it's it's one thing to go out after that would be vengeance. Yes. Sir. Uh, it, uh, by the way, and we're not saying I want to make this clear. We're not saying that a, a person who owns a business does not have the right to protect his property. Uh, right. That's not what we're saying. He does have a right to protect his property, but he does not have a right to go out after. There's a difference in the self-protection, the protection of property and person, as well as 
the idea of vengeance. And that's really one of the areas that I, I wanted us to hone in on uh, today is the difference. And I think the Exodus 22, and uh, when you, when you uh, lay that fundamental principle down and then you expose it with the rest of what we have talked about, uh, then we see the responsibility of a man uh, to protect those things. And so I think that's, I think that's the distinction. Uh, any man that uh, has the mentality, I want another man uh, to die without um, uh, without justice or anything such as that, has a serious problem to begin with, and it's a heart issue in regards to how he is thinking. And we've been, Mike, over the last three, maybe four weeks, that's really what we've been focusing on is how to properly think in regards to these things. And, and, Brother, and Brother Pope Joy, when you consider what Jesus said in Matthew 24, we know most of that has been fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But the principle of uh, Matthew 24, verse number 12, as relates to the elect and their hearts growing cold, we yep. see that. We yep. see them. And the longer that something takes place, just like when someone has been uh, diagnosed with cancer, and that cancer is prolonged, chemotherapy, uh, radiation. And like after a while, they're like, I'm tired of fighting. It's been going on six, seven years. I'm tired. Well, the same attitude is starting to develop in certain Christians as it relates to their love for uh, mankind is growing cold because they see the wickedness of man growing bolder and bolder in their wickedness. They're becoming champions at sin. It's almost as if, Mike, we, we and I mentioned this to a, a, a gentleman on uh, Facebook the other day. I, I, I said, you know, we can't lose the compassion for people. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when uh, innocent life is taken, I can't use that as an agenda. I, I don't, that's, that's immoral in my thinking. I've got to use, listen, I've got to be compassionate upon people. And, uh, I, when you mentioned that, my mind automatically went to Hebrews chapter 10, because in Hebrews chapter 10, Paul asked them to remember some things. That's and right, he says, yeah. if you remember the former days in which you endured a great fight of affliction, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both of reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used, for you had compassion upon me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourself that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Now, I find that interesting that he's asking them to remember that right. and in the ideal of compassion. Why? Because he says, for you have need of patience, steadfastness, right. that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. And it could have been, Mike, if you take Jerusalem and the establishment of the church, say in AD 30 to 33, and if Paul is writing about 68 to 69 AD, let's say that you have uh, 30 to 40 years that these people have endured that great fight of affliction against themselves. Paul saying, you have become weary in well-doing. Don't do that. Don't do that. And uh, so regardless of, and that's why I started this series, regardless of how people are acting in this world, we can't grow weary in well-doing, my friend. That's right. And so, hey, go ahead. Thoughts today. Uh, listen, I, I, I think it's been, we, I really wanted to deal a little bit more with the uh, honor killings and the avenger of blood than we did but uh uh but that's okay i think i i i think uh, especially honing in on the self defense versus the vengeance uh is the most important th thing that really affects us today I, I don't know christians who are arguing for honor killings by the way i, I know muslims do that i know that there are other indian uh, and we do have some brethren on here from India. I know that uh, in certain parts of the world that is a big deal. And uh, so maybe next 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 uh, Friday uh, we can tackle something like that a, a little bit more in depthly. 
Uh, but my friends, if if um, uh, if we don't give room for the wrath of God, then we shall receive the wrath of God. And uh, so, Mike, I, I want to thank you for joining me today. And and anything that you have, we have a couple minutes. If you want to wrap it up, uh, it's yeah. all. Yeah, we 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 definitely want to give room, give space for the wrath of God. And the reason why is because. God is not slack concerning his promise. Mm. He wants all men to come to repentance. You think of the uh, the city of cities of refuge, those six cities of refuge, and God wanted that there because hopefully those people will think about what they did. Even though it was accidental, they still needed to think about what they did. Well, you got people who are stealing, God wants them to come to the knowledge of the truth. I told someone today that they, they had a Bible question and they was asking someone else about this situation. And I said to them today, I said, let me give you a suggestion. Anytime you want to know uh, anything biblically, go to God. Man. Same thing with this subject. You know, we get emotional and we want to deal with this emotionally. But one thing, again, I love about that concealed handgun carry class. If you do it, you better know what you're doing. Right. One thing about the law, they're going to come down on you. And just because the law might exonerate you doesn't mean you might not get sued civilly. Right. So that's it's, it's, a, it's the real deal out there. They, people think that being a concealed handgun carrier, and uh, I'm not, I just took the class, but, you know, they think, well, now I can just kind of go out there and just shoot people and be justified. No, it don't mean that. No. Nope. Be careful. And by the way, you can be justified by the law and you can be justified by all of uh, mankind and still be held accountable to God. God knows. Woo! God knows. And uh, so, Brother Mike, uh, I want to thank you for joining me today here on Reflections. And I want to say to all of our students, thank you for joining us. I know that we had more uh, in the chat window and uh, uh, some things uh, uh, that we'll probably get to because I do see uh, uh, some questions that I didn't get to, but we'll try to do that next week. All right. God, God bless. bless. God bless. Bye-bye.